If you turn your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 19, today we're going to talk about the subject of how to know when God is speaking to you. I actually had this question come to me recently, and it's actually a pretty good question. Um, and that is, you know, you'll hear Christians, they'll say sometimes, the Lord showed me this, or the Lord told me this. And you say, well, how do you know it was the Lord talking to you, you know? Uh, you know, of course, the psychiatric world would call it a delusion of grandeur, you know, or something like this. <laughs> but uh, if you haven't seen my video on um, are Christians mentally ill, I talk about that. But uh, the fact of the matter is that God will speak to you. But we need to define how He speaks from the King James Bible. So start out here in 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to begin in verse 9. I'll show you something interesting here. Okay, it says here, And he came thither unto a cave, and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Speaking about Elijah. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, after the fire a still, small voice. Getting back to that in a minute here. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Okay. Now, that is, I believe, the best description of when God will speak to you. It is a still, small voice. But we need to look at a couple things in this passage here that will further define how God speaks to you. First of all, let's start out here in verse 9. He came thither unto a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. Now, I realize it's spoken, but, uh, you know, God's speaking to him. But the fact of the matter is, one of the ways you define if God is speaking to you is, does it match Scripture? You know, back in 1 John, I think it's chapter 4, I believe, uh, keep your hand here in 1 Kings. We'll just go back there real quick. I don't even have this as part of my notes here, but... It's important to get this. 1 John chapter 4 says, verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, where ye have, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. So when you get a spirit that comes to you and says, you know, if that spirit that's speaking through somebody or whatever the, the case may be there, if they're confessing that Jesus Christ is God, and that's important, it's not has God, or that, uh, excuse me here, that's important too, but, but the, it says there Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, all right? Now that's very important. Because people will say, well, Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He was around back, you know, 2,000 or so years ago. Uh, well, he still is in the flesh, glorified flesh. All right? When he rose from the dead, he was in his glorified body. You know, that's another study that we can't get into right now. I've talked about that before. But the fact of the matter is, when you have somebody that denies that, that Jesus Christ is no longer in the flesh, he's not God manifest in the flesh, that spirit's not from God, all right, every single time. But uh, it's important to understand that God's speaking to you. When God communicates with you, it will be according to Scripture. Very, very important to understand that. But uh, verse 10, And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenants, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left and they seek my life to take it away. Have you been there as a Christian? Does it feel sometimes like you are the only one in your family, in your area, that's saved? Mm -hmm. That's the time when a lot of times the Lord's going to start to talk to you. Why? Because you've gotten to that place of sanctification where you're different than the world. 
There's a lot of Christians that try to, to blend in with the world. They try to look like the world and act like the world. They try their very best and they just are miserable failures and God has to just whip them and whip them and whip them. God's not going to talk much to you at that point in time. I mean, if you have a child, you aren't going to sit down and talk to your child about deep things and stuff like that if your child's being disobedient. Your child gets a spanking when they're bad. Okay? Same thing with God, with His children, us His children, you know? Uh, if you're being bad, God's not going to reveal much to you or talk much to you. He's just going to give you a weapon, you know? But when you're good, you're going to find out all of a sudden that you're very much alone. And I hear this thing a lot from the brethren out there. Uh, it's incredible. I mean, as you know, the Bible talks in Matthew 24 about, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Iniquity is abounding. It's getting worse and worse. They're doing things now, putting things on in the movies and television. I don't watch either one, but you know I know of what's going on. But they're coming out with stuff from Hollywood that, that people wouldn't have dreamed of 30, 40 years ago. Even 10 years ago, a lot of it. It's disgusting. See? What's going on? More iniquity is abounding, so you as a Christian, as it gets darker around you, you're going to shine brighter as a Christian. If you are, you know, sanctifying your life and, you know, uh, sanctification means basically to be set apart. So if you are setting yourself apart and you're saying, no, sorry, I'm not going to watch that on television. In fact, I don't want to even watch television. Eh, you know, I really don't want to hear that kind of music around me. That's, uh, that's offensive to me. Um, you know, it's funny, these devils across the street here, uh, I talked to the one guy and he said, he said, the only people that have ever protested us before are lost people because they're, they're upset that we're messing up their music. <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, that's probably true. You don't run into many Bible believers out there anymore. And so these modern false Christians will say, I never heard anybody against our music before, you know. Well, there aren't many of us left, Bible-believing Christians. Now there are more coming in all the time. Sure, absolutely. And so praise the Lord for that. But you're going to feel alone a lot of times as a Bible believer. And we're going to see about the importance of this here in a minute. Verse 11. And he's... And he said, Go forth and stand upon the, the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. Okay, there you see that. We read that earlier. But what's the point? The point is there's a lot of signs and, and things and, and amazing things that are happening right now. Earthquakes and... You know, I saw out in Wyoming, there was this huge big crack that happened, you know, it's it, it's just incredible. You know, just like the hills out there, and, and just like a huge portion of it just goes, you know, and cracks and falls down into the ground. I mean, there's these huge sinkholes appearing everywhere. And I mean, the amazing force of God, you know, basically showing his power in the earth. And, but that's not how God's communicating with you as a Christian. How does he communicate with you? In a still, small voice. And you need to be get away from the flash and the glare of the world to hear that still, small voice. You know? But let's jump down here to verse 18. I'll show you another interesting thing here. Again, about the thing of being alone. He says, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Baal. We'll be bringing out some very interesting things on that in the future. Um, a lot of people, they, they think the Bible's so archaic and it doesn't relate to our modern day. You can turn your Bible to Romans chapter 11 while I'm talking here. Romans chapter 11. Uh, I'm going to show you a New Testament quotation of this passage of Scripture back here in 1 Kings 19. But, you know, a lot of people, they, they think the Bible's so distant. It's just it's back there. It's so different from back then to today. Uh, no, actually it isn't. Um, Baal worship is, is very much alive and, and uh, practiced everywhere. And uh, we're going to be talking more about that in the future. As a matter of fact, any Babel building technically is a temple to Baal. Uh, but we'll talk about that in another study. Romans chapter 11, verse 1. Let's read this. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. 
For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture saith of Elias? See, whenever you see that in your New Testament, what the scripture saith of, or the scripture saith, or whatever else, they're quoting Old Testament passages. All right. How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. That's something that you have to remember. Even though you feel alone, uh, there are still quite a few Bible-believing Christians out there. You are not in some kind of a cult that uh, you've been deceived and brought into this thing. You know, I, myself, other people, we've looked for truth all over the world. You know, we've, we've looked in many different systems. I mean, I can't say I've looked up everything and tried to be, you know, every religious system out there. I haven't. But I know other people that have. Uh, Christians and things that have tried to be Buddhists or tried to be come out of Roman Catholicism or, you know, whatever. The truth is in Jesus Christ. And the truth for English-speaking Christians is in this King James Bible. All right. So when you feel alone, you still have to remember that there are still thousands upon thousands of Christians out there that believe just like you do, and they're going through the same trials that you do. And you know, one of the reminders that's going to come in this time period of just tremendous falling away and, and horrible iniquity and everything, one of the things that God is going to do in this time is He is going to speak to you. He is going to show you things if you are living apart from the world. Now, like I said, if you are living very wickedly, if you are doing a lot of wicked things, you're just going to be, and you're saved, you know, you're, you're just going to be getting chastisement from the Lord. But when you're really trying to live right, God will start to speak to you. And we're going to talk about the ways that He will do that. Let me show you another interesting tie into this whole thing of God speaking to you. Turn over to Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Romans 8, verse 14 through 18 says here, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, hmm, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Keep that in mind. Uh, when your family calls you crazy, when people put you down, uh, the sufferings of this present time, I mean, you know, go into the millennial kingdom and uh, it's 558 years, just pick a number, <laughs> into the millennial kingdom and we're ruling and reigning on this earth with, with Jesus Christ and you're looking out and, and seeing how the earth has been restored by the Lord and everything has changed and now the whole world is worshiping Jesus Christ. All the, there's no more Catholics, there's no more Muslims, there's no more whatever, Protestants, you know. Uh, everybody's saved. Uh, or I shouldn't say everybody's saved. Everybody is uh, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. He's over in Jerusalem, seated over there. Are you really going to care about people laughing at you? Are you going to just be like, you know, one saint comes up and he's walking down the street and another one meets him and he looks kind of, you know, a little bit, you know, dark circles under his eyes and he looks like he hasn't slept. And the other one saint says to the sleepy looking one, he says, uh, what, what's going on? I haven't slept in days. I, I just can't get this out of my head, what it was like back there, back before the rapture, when, you know, in the church age where I was just getting persecuted. I just I can't sleep. <laughs> of course not. We're not even going to care. We're not even going to think about this stuff. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. It's not going to matter. All right? But I want to point to another thing here. First of all, God will speak to you in a still, small voice. All right? And I need to go through some scriptures here to set the stage for this thing. God will speak to you in a still, small voice that lines up with His Word. All right? Now, how does that work out? Well, there are many times um, 
he'll do this a lot of times in the evening, a lot of like right before you go to bed or, or in the morning, early morning and things has been my experience. You might have a different experience, but you'll be laying there and all of a sudden it'll just be like this thought will come into your mind. I wonder what the Bible says about such and such, some subject. Huh. I don't know. And you'll just get obsessed. You know, just like, you know what? I need, I got to get up. I got to, you know, I, I got to figure this out. You know, and you'll go and you'll grab a concordance and you'll look it up and you'll be like, hey, there's the word. I wonder what it says. And you'll be flipping in your Bible and stuff like this. What's going on there? Well, the Holy Spirit is leading you into a truth. God is speaking to you, all right, through his word, according to his word. That's one of the ways that that will happen. Um, another thing that will happen, and again, you know, for me to define this, it's very, very difficult. Um, it's the still small voice of the Lord. It's like a father speaking to his child. We read about that right here, you know, and, you know, Again, it's not, and you know, you'll get these charismaniac nuts and they'll be like, you know, I heard an audible voice and it told me that I'm supposed to, you know, uh, climb up a telephone pole until people give me $50,000 and then I come down and build a, a Babel building with it or something. You know, <laughs> no, I don't think so. You know, God told me I had a vision and he told me I need to build a million dollar Babel building and bring people into it. Huh. Well, uh, okay, can you line that up with scripture? No, <laughs> watch out for some of that stuff. What will happen when God speaks to you? It'll be almost a thought, kind of like an impression. It's a voice, but it's not an audible voice that you're hearing in your head. It's, it's just kind of like a, a thought and you'll just get, you know, obsessed with that thing. It'll just be like, like, you know, I had a brother write to me and he said, you know, I'm going to use his example. I'm not going to name his name or anything like that because it was a private, you know, email and I keep that stuff quiet. But he said that, uh, you know, he got this real strong impression about writing a tract. And, you know, he's not been saved for real long and he's just like, I just want to witness to people. I just, you know, I want to tell people about the Lord, but I'd like to write my own tract. And he just, he just was like, Oh, you know, he was at work and he's like, I just, you know, man, I, I can't wait to get done with work. I just can't even keep my mind focused on my job right now. I just, oh, I got to write this tract. That's the Lord speaking. Now, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be that you're sitting there and all of a sudden, you, you know, you hear this noise and this low, deep voice says, you know, Brian, I want you to write a tract or something. You know, no, it doesn't have to be like that. But you'll get this, a very strong impression. And I'll give you another little example of, of how this thing works out, how it worked out in my life. And that is the one time, I've told this story before, but I'll repeat it again. The one time I was taking a fan apart, this big box fan, 20-inch box fan, and uh, it was in the winter time. And I remember I was going to pull, you know, the, it, was, it was shot basically, and I was going to use some of the parts for another fan and things and scrap some of the, the wire and whatever else I could. And, um, and so I grab, you know, I'm trying to get things. I'm, I, I was taking the screws off the back of the thing, taking the covers off, taking the motor apart a little bit there, you know, taking the motor off the mount and the metal frame. And, and I had to pull the wires that go from the motor up to the little switch that you turn on. And so I had taken my, I had these big heavy leather gloves on cause it was right in the middle of winter. And I took this leather glove off on my right hand so I could, you know, get the screws out better. You know, it's kind of hard with big, thick leather gloves. So I'm like taking this thing apart and I go and I grab these wires and I thought, oh, I'm just going to, you know, I couldn't, they're like press fit into the switch, you know. So I thought, I'm just going to yank these things out. And I grab a hold of these wires and this thought, you know, voice thing in my head, it's, it says, put your glove back on. And me and my stubborn, you know, foolishness, you know, bullheadedness I was like that'll oh, be all right and I went and I grabbed the I just yanked the wires like this thinking you know I'm just going to give them a good yank here I don't know if they'll come out or not well they came out but forcing me going like that I went down and actually hit the housing of the fan right there and uh you know I've, you've probably seen my scar and other videos and I went right down into the bone cut my tenon right in half in the top part of my thumb right there, just whoop, just sliced it, just like a razor blade. 
right down into the bone. And I ended up having to go to the hospital and get seven stitches. And I don't go to the hospital, believe you me. But it was like one of them deals where I'm holding it like this. And I walked inside and I went. And, uh, you know, I was at my parents' place at the time. And my dad, I told him what I did. And he's like, well, we got to go to the hospital. I was like, I'm not going to the hospital. I don't go to the hospital. <laughs> and I went in to clean up. And I let go at the sink. And it just like the skin went. And I am went, oh, boy, that's a lot worse than I thought. So my stupidity and not listening to the Lord. And that was the Lord that put that thought into my head. That wasn't my common sense or some other type of a deal like that. It was the Lord. And I've had that thing happen a couple times. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I wear leather, leather gloves when I'm doing stuff like that now, <laughs> you know, even if it's inconvenient. Put the leather glove on, you know, I don't need another finger cut badly. But I've had that thing happen a couple times where it's just like I get that voice that says, do this, don't do that. And again, it's not this audible voice that's like, a, oh, I can hear it ringing in my ears. It's just like a thought. That's, that's how I can describe it. But that's the still small voice. But now there's another way that God will speak to you. Look at verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. All right? Another way that the Lord will communicate with you is through other children, your family members in the Lord. That's another way. I cannot tell you how many times my wife and I literally have been having conversations. We'll get up in the morning, we're getting out of bed, and we'll you know read the Bible in the morning, and then, and then we're coming downstairs and we're talking about some subject in the Scripture, and it's just like, what do you think the Bible teaches about this? And a lot of times we won't even eat till we look up you know, the verses and things. And we'll be looking up this stuff, and we'll talk about it, and it'll be like, wow, that's really something. You know, we probably ought to do a study on this. Get done with breakfast, get on, get online, and it's like somebody will write an email. Hey, could you do a study on this subject or something? The thing that we were talking about that morning. I can't tell you how many times that that's happened. God will confirm things through other believers. Uh, when I went into ministry, um, at first I was not accepting donations. Because I was just in this thing, you know, well, I'm just going to do this thing for free and I'm you know, going to work on the side and stuff. I wasn't really planning to be full time. And it was just like numerous brethren came along and said, we want to donate to the ministry. We want you to be full time in this thing. Um, we want, you know, you to put out as many videos as possible. And I was, well, you know, and they were giving me scripture and I was just like, well, OK, you know, I, I, I guess I can. And, you know, maybe whatever. <laughs> and it was just like. People that aren't even related in different countries of the world are telling me the same things. What's going on? The Spirit is bearing witness with our spirit. The other children in my family are telling me what the Father wants. Again, I've, I've had you know other brothers and sisters in Christ uh, correct me on different things, and I look it up, and I look it in the Scriptures, and I say, oh, and the, and the Lord says, yeah, you know, <laughs> how about that? See? That's why it's important to have fellowship with brothers and sisters in your local church. Eh, wrong. <laughs> okay, local church is not a Bible term. Um, assembling of saints, called out assemblies where Christians come together and meet in homes or wherever, you know. And, and I, you know, people say, well, you can still meet in a church and it's still, you know, the church is the people, not the building. Tell that to the people that meet in the buildings. They don't believe that for one minute. They idolize the building and the buildings are Baal temples. You know, again, I've proved that in other studies. And I know, you know, people get all offended at this stuff and everything. Look it up, brethren. Look up Greek Parthenon and then put an obelisk on top of the Greek Parthenon. You have a church building. They're pagan. You can't show me anywhere in Scripture in the New Testament where they're meeting in buildings and calling them churches. It's not there. And I keep harping on this thing over and over and over again because Christians need to get out of it. I mean, you know, how do you think God would have felt back in the Old Testament if the Jews would have said, oh, we're going to meet here in, you know, this, this temple of Baal, but we're going to say it's for you, Lord. You know, God didn't like it back then. When the children of Israel started to worship Baal and started to do things, pagan types of things like that, God got very, very angry about that. You know, how do you think it is today? Have his feelings changed? No, they have not. And I'm going to tell you right now, I believe one of the reasons that the rapture hasn't happened yet is because there's still too many Christians in 
those pagan temples, and they need to get they need to get out of them. And as time goes by, you're going to see more and more Christians leaving them. And also, you're starting to see more and more natural you know natural disasters, acts of God wiping out these Babel buildings. I've seen a lot of it on YouTube: lightning strikes. You know, mudslides and things, wiping these things out. Yeah. I saw one, there was some Babel building, and all these birds are dying around the Babel building. The Spirit of God is saying, come out, come out, come out, you know. And again, I saw somebody write in the comments, and they said uh, that, uh, how was that, something about, you know, there has to be saved Christians in the Roman Catholic Church because the Bible says about, come out of her, my people. You know, that you be not partaker of her sins and things, receive not of her plagues. Uh, well, don't forget that Mystery Babylon has daughters. And I reject Roman Catholicism having saved people in it because of Roman Catholicism's system of salvation, which I've studied, is not biblical salvation. Now, you might have somebody in the Protestant system that could get saved in that type of a system, but they still need to come out of it. They're in Mystery Babylon. They're in one of the daughters of the whore. That's why I make such emphatic points about this. And as time goes by, it's not even going to be an option to go to these buildings anymore. You know? I mean, it's just, things are getting very, very bad. But again, you will see that oftentimes those people that you have, that you fellowship with and things, and again, you know, I recommend get off by yourself, get your relationship right with the Lord. God will bring other people into your midst to minister to them. And even, you know, if you get new converts, you can teach them the things of the Lord and, and you know, develop your fellowship that way. But what will happen is a lot of times you will actually have brothers and sisters in Christ confirm things that the Lord has been showing you. Again, I, I see this in the comments. I'll see somebody, you know, I, I put out a video and somebody will go, man, you know, I, I just was doing the same study. You know, it's, this is really weird. You know, like, wow, how is this possible? Well, it's, it's the Holy Spirit confirming things two different children. That's another way that God will speak to you. Let's see about this thing of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, the Spirit of Truth. John 14, starting at verse 15. It says here, If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Notice it's a capital C. The title of the Holy Spirit is the Comforter. Verse 17, even the Spirit of truth. So who is the Comforter? Even the Spirit of truth. That's another way that you can define things in your King James Bible. King James Bible is God's perfect word. I'll tell you what, it's amazing how it defines itself many times. It's, you know, God wrote this book. You say, oh no, it's 57 or, you know, 54 translators, 47 towards the end. No, no, you know, God directed those guys. But this book comes from God. I mean, there's just no way you could put this thing together as a man. But notice how it says it there. The comforter, you know, another comforter there in verse 16, verse 17, even the spirit of truth. But let's continue. Check this out. Whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. You know why a lot of people don't understand this New Testament? They say, oh, it contradicts and it's this and that. They don't have the spirit of truth. They cannot receive the truth. Why do your lost relatives and things have such a hard time accepting what you believe and what you say? Because they can't receive it. Until you get to that point where you are broken... And you say, I'm no good. I can't trust in my own self-righteousness to be saved. I'm a good person. You know, you come to the point where you say, I'm not a good person. I'm a bad person. God, please save me. You come to him in, a, in that repentant state and God will save you. And then the spirit of truth will start to speak to you and start to show you things. That's why you have so many professing Christians in this world right now that literally hate the truth. Isn't that weird? And you know, I'll tell you what, it's so funny. I mean, it's just like, I've dealt with these, these professing Christians now for so many years. And you know, you, you show them something, it's just the Bible's plain. It's just 
boom, right there. And, and they go, that's your interpretation. And I say, wait a second. That's what lost people tell me. This is a professing Christian, but lost people say the same things as this Christian. I wonder why. Probably because they're both lost. You know, and I and I realize that there are some there are some points of debate and things like that that you can Christians can disagree, you know, agree to disagree on certain things in the Bible. I, I, I'm aware of that, but I'm talking major doctrinal things. You get these people that profess to be Christians, profess to be saved, and yet they come right out and say, "That's just your interpretation." Well, that depends on how you look at it. Act just like lost people, and they'll get mad just like lost people if you continue to press them on the truth. Weird, huh? But let's continue here. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am uh, in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Speak in a still small voice. You know, this book here, we're going to read this verse. Well, actually, you know what? Let's just go there right now. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to show you the key, one of the keys to understanding Scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now, let's just say you get together with somebody and you say, they say, hey, how are you doing? You say, oh, I'm doing pretty good. And they say, I don't believe that. Well, I, I just got done saying I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, I know, but I think you're lying to me. And then they say, oh, so, uh, you know, how's, uh, how's your job going or how's your, you know, life do doing or whatever? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. You know, I'm, I'm actually thinking about moving to another state. And that same person goes, no, I don't believe that either. What are you talking about? I'm telling you the truth. What do you? Yeah, you say you're telling me the truth, but I just don't believe it. Would you want to have a conversation with that person? Not if you had any sense. No. What do you think God thinks when somebody comes to this book and they say, "Yeah, I don't believe that." Acts eight thirty seven. Yeah, you know what? That's really not in the oldest and best manuscripts. Yeah, you know those last couple verses there in the book of Mark. Yeah, that, that shouldn't be in there either. Or you get somebody and they say, yeah, you know, well, there are certain parts of Scripture that I think are more allegorical or more, they're not to be taken literally. And they expect to hear from God? <laughs> are you crazy? Of course not. Revelation of Scripture is based on your belief. If you believe that this book is God's book, that you say, this King James Bible is God's Word. God will show you things out of it. He will reveal things to you from this book. The Spirit of Truth will come to you. And notice too, it says there, go back to John chapter 14. In verse 16, he's called the Comforter. What do you need when you're all alone? A Comforter? You know, those times when people that you love, the people that you care about, your family, your friends and they mock you and they put you down. You know, sometimes, you know, there, there are those of us that can really take that. You know, you just kind of go, yeah, whatever, you know. But I'll tell you what, it gets to you sometimes. It starts to hurt. You need a comforter at that time. You know, if you have a, a little child and that little child gets hurt, you know what they want? A comforter. And you don't go, oh, it's okay, it's, you're fine, you're feeling okay. No, you say, are you okay? Are you all right? Daddy's right here. Don't worry about it. You speak, you speak in a still, small voice. Scripture with Scripture, it all lines up. But let's continue. Verse 22. 
Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye heard is not, or which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, look at this, which is the Holy Ghost, definitely defined there, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. You know, I heard a guy say the one time, I think it was Dr. Frank Logsdon, uh, he was originally working with the New American Standard Version, and then he repented of that thing, got away from it, and um, I have the recording here on YouTube, one of my older videos, and he said, he said, and this is a very interesting statement, he said, the King James Bible is the only book that the author is present every time you read it, you know. There are no book signings where the Holy Ghost shows up down in, you know, New York, New York City, and you can drive there and have him sign the Bible for you. Uh-uh. Wherever you are, the Holy Spirit, also called the Holy Ghost in the King James Bible, he goes by both titles, the Holy Ghost can teach you all things. Keep your hand there. I'll show you another verse real quickly if you're not familiar with this one. Over in the book of James... Another one of the key scriptures, James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. You want to understand this book, you ask the Lord. Separate yourself from the world. Learn to hear God's voice, you and him. Not, well, my preacher told me this, and my preacher, my preacher, my preacher. It's so disgusting, you know, that my video I did with Jack Hiles, and they're like at his funeral, and they're just like worshiping this guy. This is how the boss liked it. And they're talking about Jack Hiles. You know, we're going to sing the songs the way that the boss liked it. You know, uh, I thought the Lord Jesus Christ is supposed to be your boss if you're saved. Guy was running a satanic cult out there, mind controlling his followers. Jack Hiles I'm talking about there. Just disgusting. Very, very wicked man. But the whole point of this study is I want people to realize that it's the Lord that you need to have the, your relationship with. And it's His Word that is your standard of truth. Again, I've said this thing so many times here. You're probably going, you're nodding your head going, yeah, we've heard this before. Yeah, I'm going to keep saying it though because you have to keep that in mind. I'll get people and they'll say, you know, who do you recommend, you know, that we listen to? And I say, you know, any preacher that reads from the King James Bible. Well, but what if he's wrong? Then say, okay, he's wrong in that subject. What if he's wrong in a bunch of subjects? Then don't listen to him anymore. See? The Holy Spirit will teach you these things. I remember Martin Richling, this, this wicked false prophet, this disgusting guy, and, I mean, he'll just, like, mock you and make fun of you and, and put you down. And he'll, you know, everybody else is stupid compared to Martin Richling in, in his own little world that he has there. And I remember I was, you know, back and forth with the guy a little bit in videos. And uh, I made a statement about how the, you know, the Holy Spirit will bear witness. And, you know, you listen to Martin Richling for five minutes. It won't even take you five minutes listening to the guy. And you'll realize this guy's false. And he, he laughed about that. He mocked that. He's like, ah, you know, you get a feeling me and stuff. Why? He doesn't understand. You know, the Bible talks in John chapter 10 about the voice of a hireling that the sheep that belong to Jesus Christ, they won't listen to the hireling. Something will just feel wrong about the guy. You know, and I get brethren all the time. They'll say it about me. They'll say, you know, you know, brother, brother Brian, I, I appreciate you and I'm thankful for, you know, different stands that you take. I don't agree with you in everything, but, you know, I praise the Lord for your ministry. That's fine. You don't have to agree with me in everything. Again, the Bible's your standard, not me. But when you get somebody and you'll listen and it's just like, something just isn't right here. I don't know what it is. It's just something not right here, you know? And I, again, I get people listening. They'll listen to Stephen Anderson. And at first it's just like, 
yeah, you know, I'm, I got roped in by him years and years ago. I thought, oh, this, this is pretty good, you know. This, some just a Baptist and stuff. I was militantly Baptist many years ago before the Lord opened my eyes on that issue. But uh, I remember thinking, well, Stephen Anderson sounds pretty good. And then it was like I started hearing things, and, and I was like, ooh, uh, uh-oh, <laughs> you know. Uh, something's a little bit rotten down in Phoenix, you know. And I've seen people do that. You know, I've seen people and they just like, they'll start listening to Stephen Anderson and they go, yeah, you know, praise the Lord, he stands for the King James Bible. And what did he just say? And it, it just like, oh, that's, that's kind of bad. You know, and I've, you know, I've even heard from people that have gone and visited his little Babel building down there and they'll walk in and it's just like, whoa, <laughs> you know, like I'm, I'm in some kind of cult thing here or something, you know, good night. God will speak to you through multiple ways. God's Holy Spirit will come to you when you get saved. Again, it's not the charismaniac thing. You got to get the Holy Spirit by, you know, going up to the altar in the front and praying for the Holy Ghost to come on you so you can start flapping your tongue around and acting like a maniac. No, 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 no. When you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit. And at that point in time, a true manifestation of the Holy Spirit, you know, like the charismaniac said, oh, I saw manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Uh, no, actually you didn't. Because a true manifestation of the Holy Spirit is acceptance of truth. All of a sudden, you're just going to become obsessed with the book. And you're going to be obsessed with witnessing to people. You will see a major life change. And you'll still sin. And you'll still struggle with sin. And you're going to have a hard time with it sometimes. And you're going to have to go through that process of sanctification. I am not teaching sinless perfection. All right? But you will see a change. I mean, you plug yourself into the God of the universe and say, okay, I'm saved now. And his Holy Spirit comes in and indwells within you. And you go, I didn't feel a thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Uh, no. If you get saved, if you get truly born again, you're going to feel a difference. Something's going to happen. All right? And, you, you know, again, people say, well, you know, and they get all theological about this and they try to debate it. And I shouldn't say theological. They get philosophical. Uh, well, what if, you know, what if somebody gets saved and they, and they actually continue in sin? What about the guy in 1 Corinthians 5 and blah, blah, blah? Listen to me. Listen to me. There is nothing on this earth more important than your salvation. Not one thing. And in the old days, people would agonize over their salvation. Everything else would fall by the wayside their lives would just you know they would they would spend months sometimes in agony until they knew that they were saved why they realized the serious nature of it this flippant easy believism thing you just believe just believe yeah, believe just believe it's not there's no change whatever can you imagine what it'd be like to just go through life and say, oh, I'm a Christian, you know, yeah, I do this, and yeah, I do that. You know, it doesn't, my conscience doesn't convict me and end up in hell for eternity. Stand there before Jesus Christ and have him look down and point the finger at you and say, depart from me, cursed and everlasting fire. I never knew you. Whew. That's why I preach so hard about this changed life thing. And again, I don't say you have to be sinlessly perfect. You have to just be just totally transformed at the moment of salvation. My word, no. <laughs> I got better sense than that. I mean, if I believe that way, that you become sinlessly perfect at salvation, why would I have sermons on gluttony and smoking and, you know, sins that Christians commit? Why bother preaching on sin if Christians become sinlessly perfect at salvation? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. You're going to struggle with sin. But you better make sure that you are saved. You say, I don't know for sure. Then get it figured out. Get down on your knees and you say, Lord, I don't know. That's what I did. I prayed a prayer of salvation in Sunday school when I was eight years old. And I thought to myself for years and years and years, oh, I'm a Christian. You know, yeah, I looked at a lot of pornography and yeah, I cussed. And yeah, I listened to satanic heavy metal, you know, Megadeth, Metallica, ACDC. I was listening to all that junk. You know, and yeah, I ran out, you know, ran around with the popular crowd in high school and went to parties and things like that. But I was a Christian the whole time, yeah. And I got to the point where I got scared and I thought, you know what, I don't know. And I was, you know, I was cleaning my life up and things and I was getting, 
you know, back with the Lord. But I thought, you know, if I died right now, I do not know for sure, 100% sure that I'd go to heaven. And everything else took a back seat. I was self-employed at the time and I just thought, you know what? I don't even care about making money right now. I was working as a wood turning artist and things and it was just like, I don't even care. I don't care about this. You know, I'd made a statement years earlier that I'd rather die than not, you know, be in wood turning. And it got to a point where it was like, I actually did die. I died to myself. I died to my self-righteousness. And I got that thing figured out. And I said, Lord, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. Uh, I want to know. I need to know. This is the most important thing in my life. And I got saved. The Lord saved me. And my whole life changed at that point in time. Uh, I still struggled with sin, with sin for a while. And I still struggle with sin, by the way. I'm not sinlessly perfect, nor will I ever be. Um, I'm still going to mess up. You're still going to mess up as a Christian. But you're going to go through that process, that Elijah process, especially now. Good night. You're going to feel very alone sometimes. But you know what? When you get to that point, when you start to really feel alone because you've gotten rid of this and you've gotten rid of that and you can't do this and you can't do that, you know? And it's so funny because everything that you give up for the Lord, all those things that you've given up are all negative. God's not going to tell you, I want you to give up, uh, you know, raw, organic fruits and vegetables for me. <laughs> you know, of course, he's not going to do that. He made them, you know? He's not going to tell you, I want you to give up... Um, sleep because sleep is evil you know don't bathe because bathing is evil no no of course not whatever the lord tells you to give up it's all hurting you but you know what it's going to put you at odds with your lost friends and family and all of a sudden you're going to start to feel like elijah and you're going to start to feel like i'm left alone and the lord says nope i have a remnant that's what you are as a King James Bible believer right now, Bible believing Christian, I was going to say. You are a remnant. We are not in the majority. But there's a lot of us. Don't forget that. You're not alone in what you're going through. And the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Someday you're going to get up there to heaven and you're going to say, Boy, I sure went through some things. And the Lord will say, I did too. I can relate to you. I mean, isn't that a weird thought? You know, when you think about it, that God can relate to you. And He's putting you through some things right now in this life that is strengthening your relationship. How about that? The God of the universe. The source of all life. By Him all things consist. And He wants you to know Him on a personal level. You know, we just say, you know, it's just a, a kind of a thing you say, we're supposed to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, you just kind of repeat it. But you don't often think about the ramifications of that whole thing. That You don't often think about how it all works out. The God of the universe wants me to know Him personally. I mean, wouldn't it be a weird thing if, if uh, all of a sudden you get a telephone call and... I can't use the president because I wouldn't want to talk to him, but you, know, you get some telephone call from some like really important person and they say, could you come over to my house? I just want to get to know you personally. You'd be like, huh, what? You know, I mean, you know, we'll go back into the 1600s. We'll say King James, you know, you're, you're there on the street, you know, walk along and all of a sudden here comes the king and he says, hey, hold, stop the royal procession here. Hey, you, you. Could you come with me? I want to go take you back to the castle. I'd, I'd just like to spend some time with you. Tell you about my personal feelings and things like that. And just I want to hear about your day and whatever. You'd be like, me? You want to talk to me? Well, how much bigger is our God? And he wants to have that personal relationship with you. But it can only happen through his son, Jesus Christ. It can only happen when you are set apart from the world. When you go through that Elijah experience and the priests of Baal that are all out there seeking your life 
and they are, by the way, don't kid yourself, don't think to yourself, well, the Catholics are okay with us and stuff. The priests of Baal, when they have their way, they will be torturing believers in Jesus Christ again. All the little nice Catholic ecumenical stuff, it's all a smokescreen. They are building their army, and the longer we're here, the more persecution is going to come, but they can't touch you unless God gives them permission. Remember that, too. So, just wanted to put together this little message here. Going to be talking about another subject coming up here, another video. Um, got a lot of different projects going. Uh, and uh, But this is one I think, I've been saying this for a while now. The Lord showed me this. The Lord told me that. And I haven't really defined it. I know that probably a lot of you out there have questions about this subject. So, hopefully I've answered your questions. Um, you have to try the spirits. That's another thing I didn't mention, and that is a lot of times that the devil will try to get you to do things as well. He'll try to deceive you. So that's why it's important to know the book. You've got to know your King James Bible. You've got to believe what you're reading and not say, well, it is just a translation. You know, it's, I mean, you know, again, just to explain the thing basically, if you don't understand the Bible version issue, uh, the King James Bible is from a different whole different set of Greek manuscripts than the new versions. The NIV, the NASV, the um, you know ESV, all that stuff. Even the New King James Version will mix uh, Texas Receptus readings with the Alexandrian Greek readings. But the main issue is not what Greek text. The main issue is can you hold a book in your hands and say this is God's book. I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to accept any corrections of this book. Because if I did, then that would prove the person correcting it is smarter than God. <laughs> That's the main issue. Can you put your hands on a Bible and say, this is God's book, I don't change it. It's perfect. If I don't understand it, then it's my problem, it's not the book's problem. Can you put your hands on a book like that? See, that's the main issue. But it's so important to have this as your standard. And... You know, when you start to have thoughts and this, you know, these impressions in your mind, doesn't line up with Scripture. So, that's very important. I wanted to make a, a statement about that yet. You know, about the the devil will work on you sometimes, just like the Lord will work on you. That's why it's important to know the book, because when you get a thought and you say, "Wait a second, no, that doesn't line up with Scripture," reject it. You know, so that's going to be it for this study. Uh, please do keep us in your prayers. Uh, the, the spiritual warfare, um, it's, I just think it's, it's heating up as time goes by. It's, uh, things are getting so crazy in our world right now. It's just like, you know, things are getting nuts in this world. And that's why we need to pray for each other. Um, we need to uphold each other in prayer. Uh, and we really do covet your prayers. Um, it means a lot to us. We can feel them. There are times I, I've said this before, and I'll say this in closing, and that is, I've felt many times where it's just like I can't continue. I just I'm ready to give up. I mean, it's just like it's bad, and all of a sudden my everything will change, and I'll just start feeling so much better. And I know that that's a Christian praying for me. So uh, we thank you for your prayers. And uh, that will be it. We will see you in the next study.